Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Jack Schneider. Uh, so <clears throat> let's start with a statement. Improvements in the school organization, school hours, apparatus, and textbooks are vain without good teachers. So said the editors of the Pennsylvania School Journal in 1871. So obviously this sounds a lot like what we hear today. In announcing race to the top, for instance, Barack Obama observed that, and I'll spare you my Obama impression, <laughs> the single most important factor in education is the person in front of the classroom. In other words, fix the teachers and you'll fix the schools. It's an old idea. And over time, the idea has manifested in a variety of policy solutions, most consistently in efforts to improve teacher preparation. Fix the training, in other words, and you'll fix the teachers, which is another old idea. But aside from novelty's sake, why take the long view, right? Why begin with a historian, particularly when you're considering the policy future? The simplest answer, and I'm gonna keep things pretty simple today, is that things look different when we see them in the context of a longitudinal trajectory. So this looks a lot different than this. Today I'm gonna to track the history of teacher preparation from its origins to the present. And as I do, I'm going to tell two stories at the same time. The first of those stories is about problems. It's a linear story in which problems are discovered <coughs> potential solutions are generated and results are achieved. This story moves from the past to the future as well as from the old to the new. The other story is about dilemmas. Rather than being linear in nature, it's parabolic. Believe me, I had to consult my high school math textbook. <laughs> Time passes along an x-axis and the area beneath the curve represents work, at least if I did my rereading properly. But rather than sloping ever upward, the line bends and returns back to the original Y coordinate. The structure of this talk will attempt to capture both of these shapes. So the story will proceed chronologically, highlighting improvements in teacher preparation across time. But that relatively linear chronology has been organized into four periods and then true to parabolic form, the last of those periods will bear a striking resemblance to the first. But before diving into that history, let's clarify the difference between a problem and a dilemma. So maybe the simplest way to distinguish between the two is to say that whereas a problem can be solved, a dilemma can only be managed. As Larry Cuban defines it, problems are defined by gaps between what is and what ought to be. Closing the gap requires creative thinking, the development of new approaches and tools, and the investment of resources. And though the work is challenging, it's certainly possible. Problems can be solved. A dilemma, by contrast, is complicated and conflict-filled. And managing a dilemma requires making hard choices between competing values. Dilemmas can be managed in different ways, but they can't be resolved. Teacher educators have faced myriad problems across time, and a great deal of progress has been made with regard to identifying and addressing these. In terms of issues like content preparation, student teaching, reflection cycles, and so on, teacher education has undoubtedly improved over time. And even though there's no uniformity across programs, something Bob was alluding to earlier, effective practices have been adopted, even by organizations that pride themselves on being an alternative to teacher education. Yet, teacher education is also characterized by several core dilemmas, and these dilemmas reflect the constraints that are set by context. That's something a historian will always say. Um, these constraints limit what can be accomplished and which often require undesirable trade-offs. So before mapping out some of those dilemmas, let's just touch on a few of the constraints that shape them. So one of those constraints is public funding. That limits revenue streams. And this built-in form of cost suppression translates directly into limits on teacher salary, which in turn affects teacher training. A second factor is scale. Today, 50 million students attend roughly 100,000 schools and are educated by over 3.5 million teachers. Scale exacerbates the cost problem, but it also represents an important challenge in its own right. 
The need for a massive number of teachers places big limitations on the length and selectivity of teacher education programs and also presents a major organizational challenge. A third constraint is the principle of equality or equity. Though not often achieved in practice, the principle of it demands relatively equal opportunity for all children. And as a result, there's a pull for sameness and sameness structures like bureaucracy. <laughs> Finally, there's the perceived importance of education, especially with regard to getting ahead. Because concern with school quality translates into concern with teacher quality, this factor raises the stakes of our dilemmas. Okay, so we have four underlying contextual factors, but what are the dilemmas that they shape? I'm gonna quickly outline three of them. So the first is length versus volume. And by that I mean the length of training versus the volume of teachers produced. Finding millions of teachers to staff schools is a really challenging enterprise, and particularly when costs are suppressed. The most immediate effect of the cost issue is that salaries stay relatively low, and that reduces the pool of applicants. But cost suppression also impacts teacher preparation by limiting the duration of training. Candidates in training pay direct costs and they pay indirect costs or opportunity costs. So the more that training extends these, the fewer candidates there will be. A lot of people have tried to solve this issue over time in various ways with longer training or shorter training or competency-based training or free training. As a dilemma though, there's no real solution here, not a systemic one. The second dilemma is specificity versus generality. In other words, how specific or general is the training? Much of the best preparation for work happens on the job through context-specific training. But in education, the need to provide a general training before a teacher is hired is really powerful. The critical importance of education means that unprepared teachers just really can't or should not be placed into schools. And the equity principle means that it really shouldn't happen in just some schools. Over the years, reformers have proposed plenty of solutions, but again, this is a dilemma, not a problem. The third dilemma is flexibility versus security. Freedom to do what you think works, in other words, versus a guarantee that it's actually working. The skills of good teachers can't adequately be identified through credentials, not at the individual teacher level. In a smaller system with greater cost flexibility, it might be possible for a highly trained group of evaluators to examine teacher practice directly, but that's not the case here. Over-reliance on credentials then keeps a lot of good applicants out of the classroom, which then seems to call for flexibility around qualifications and the design of teacher preparation. But too much flexibility would lead to concerns about quality in a critically important field where equity matters. So there you have it, dilemma number three. Many shifts in teacher preparation over time have been driven by these three dilemmas as policy leaders have landed on one strategy or another. So barriers to entry, for instance, they go up, they go down, sometimes they go up and down at the same time, but they don't make the core problem go away. There is no answer because it isn't a problem, right? It's a dilemma and so it persists. But it's also to remember important to remember that there have been lots of problems, and many of them have been solved. In that sense, teacher preparation is getting better all the time. So in order to make that clear, I'm gonna take you on a quick historical tour, and we'll do 200 years of history in 10 minutes, so we will skip one or two things along the way. <laughs> and though we'll move chronologically, I'm gonna divide time into four distinct periods. So here we go, arrow one. Uh, before the first common schools in the 1830s, students studied at home, in apprenticeships, in dame schools, which I was going to explain, but then I would run out of time and I would get the hook, uh, in private schools, in free schools for paupers, and in some places in tax-supported public schools. Uh, during the first decades of the 19th century then, there was no standard for a qualified teacher. There were no barriers to entry. Given the absence of a standard, teachers were generally selected on pretty minimal criteria, like ability to maintain order. An example interview is illustrative, and I almost made somebody read this out in a pair reading with me. <laughs> Chairman, how old are you? Candidate, I was 18 years old the 27th day of last May. Chairman, do you think you can make our big youngsters mind? Candidate, yes, I think I can. Chairman, well, I'm satisfied. I guess you'll do for our school. 
Without clear standards, there was also a lot of abuse in hiring. In Ted Sizer's words, the absence of laws around licensure and hiring led to, quote, a system in which some mayor's half-drunk, illiterate uncle was hired to teach 12th grade English. Needless to say, this was not ideal. What did teacher training look like? Well, for the most part, it didn't exist. Those who did get a bit of training usually got it during a few weeks uh, from a summer workshop lasting anywhere from a few weeks or down to just a few days. Little else was available. And given the low barriers to entry, anyone who established an extensive training requirement would have drastically reduced the number of teachers they had access to. Seeking to provide some training to future teachers, several institutions, mostly private academies, began to offer their own homegrown programs. But as common schools grew, this wasn't really a sustainable approach. So what we can see in this early period is that dilemmas aren't even being managed. There's total flexibility and total context specificity. But the emerging system required some guarantee of quality and some mechanism for oversight. There would have to be some generality, some length of training. And problems, well, there were lots of problems. And I'd say the biggest one is that pedagogy wasn't even a thing at this time. Right? That's like a pretty big problem. So the next era is one that I'm calling early bureaucracy. I'm channeling Michael Katz here. By 1860, a more formal program of training had cropped up in state-sponsored normal schools. Uh, these are organizations that resembled high schools and which later became state colleges. Now, most teachers continued to receive no preparation whatsoever, and policymakers knew that any requirements would limit the number of teachers available. Remember, they wanted to build a system of public schools, and they needed a lot of teachers to do that. But system building also required a degree of uniformity and standardization, so they faced a dilemma. And the most common way of managing it at the time was to impose exam-based licensure. And most states, by the, turn of the, civil, by the end of the Civil War, uh, had adopted this. So the demand for normal schools was not particularly great. Still, by 1870, there were 39 of them. And 20 years later, there were 103 of them. And 20 years later, so that's 1910, there were 180. Policy leaders were incentivizing training by exempting graduates from certification exams. By the turn of the century, 28 states were certifying teachers on the basis of graduation from a normal school or university without further examination. And that was a significant enticement. But even as momentum shifted in favor of professional education, the demand for teachers kept requirements low, as did low pay. Dilemmas aside, however, teacher training programs faced a number of basic problems at the beginning of this period that had begun to be solved by the end of it. So for one, there was actually some attention to pedagogy. What are the various modes of instruction? What works best in what particular settings? Which isn't to say that they had the answers to this, but at least they were paying attention. Another problem was that would-be teachers traditionally had very little contact with actual students. By the turn of the century, though, practice teaching was standard, though it was only a few weeks in length. A third core problem addressed by teacher training programs during this period was the weak curriculum. Many early graduates of normal schools, for instance, received no training in lesson planning, a problem that was addressed during the period and eventually solved. OK, era three is what I'm calling late bureaucracy. This is a period in which a real teacher preparation system is finally built. And it's a period in which system builders experience so much success that they get a bit carried away. By the 1920s, more or less all teachers were required to earn a license. And most were getting licensed through teacher preparation programs. Alternatives still existed. Exams, for instance, remained an option in many states. But they were rapidly being phased out. Policymakers had wanted to do this because they were interested in building a system. And systems require some degree of uniformity and standardization. They were able to do it because modern taxation made it possible to pay teachers better salaries and because K-12 enrollment had finally slowed down. So teacher supply finally caught up with demand. Programs, of course, could not continue to expand and extend training indefinitely. So they continue to face very real constraints with regard to coursework, uh, 
and practice teaching requirements. Still, as some level of standardization emerged, it created space for teacher educators to solve some long-running problems. So student teaching grew across programs and in terms of length. Content preparation emerged. And by mid-century, teacher educators began to expand their programs to, to address the importance of um, student language and culture, as well as the emergent, emerging science of learning. Naturally, some found this shift towards a single model disturbing. Critics argued that teacher education had become too general and too rigid, that it had shifted too far from the locally specific and highly flexible models that system builders had worked to improve in previous eras. Mortimer Smith, for instance, lamented the emergence of, quote, a cohesive body of believers with a clearly formulated set of dogmas and doctrines. I was going to do a scary voice for that, but I decided to just stick to my regular voice. In response, some policy leaders proposed alternatives that would manage dilemmas in a different manner. The federal government, for instance, sponsored both the Master of Arts in Teaching, the MAT program, and the Teacher Corps, programs that would favor flexibility and context specificity. Others, though, reacted much more strongly to the way that dilemmas had been managed over the previous century, and they wanted to tear the system down. And so now we enter era four. The last era here is resurgent deregulation. So during the last decades of the 20th century, with bureaucratic teacher education systems seemingly triumphant, the pendulum began to swing in the other direction. Those system builders had achieved everything they wanted, their system failed to produce perfect teachers. No surprise there. Some policy leaders continued to push for even more training. So two groups in 1986, for instance, proposed that all teachers complete master's programs. But to others, the core problem was that bureaucratic systems reduced flexibility without providing sufficient security. These critics called for a return to test-based licensure, along with a number of other things. And by the mid-1990s, half of districts were asking teachers to pass a test of basic skills as well as a subject matter test. But some reformers, seeing only the excesses of late bureaucracy, wanted to rip the whole system down. Seeing problems rather than dilemmas, they favored shorter training, locally based decision making, and maximum flexibility. And their proposed solutions, increasingly popular in the late 20th century and early 21st century, have often sounded quite a bit like teacher preparation in the er unregulated early republic. The clearest distillation of this impulse is Teach for America. TFA recruits are an academic elite, admitted through a highly selective process. They receive only the bare minimum of general training doing the rest of their learning on the job. To its boosters, TFA is proof of concept that traditional teacher education is a failure. But even if we assume that TFA core members are as well prepared as traditionally trained teachers, and that's, that's an if, perhaps a big if, there would still be questions about whether TFA has actually solved any of the dilemmas associated with training teachers. So consider the dilemma of length versus volume. TFA's theory of action is that they can shortcut training by selecting candidates who already have many of the characteristics of effective teachers. That would obviate the need to teach those traits. In order for this to succeed in any sense, they need a large pool of applicants which they ensure by framing the organization as one that opens doors to future careers, careers that are outside the classroom. Additionally, one might observe that TFA, for all its press, produces a minuscule number of teachers, less than 5% annually. At scale, then, the model simply wouldn't work, particularly given the cost, which runs roughly $50,000 a teacher. Another popular challenge to college and university-based training is embodied in Doug Lamov's Teach Like a Champion and the Relay Graduate School of Education. As supporters maintain, great teachers employ particular skills that can be learned through practice. And the implication is that the specificity versus generality dilemma can be resolved by emphasizing classroom tested techniques that work everywhere. Like always start the class by putting a do now on the board. It's a popular idea. Yet rather than resolving the tension between specificity and generality, they've just managed it differently by treating one general approach, one emphasizing things like child development, cognition, and culture, for another emphasizing practical tricks and shortcuts. All along, there are still problems being solved, problems being solved today. 
Teacher preparation programs, for instance, have developed reflection models, mentoring structures, and support networks for young teachers, and they've begun to find a balance between content preparation and pedagogical preparation, to say nothing of pedagogical content knowledge preparation. Of course, problems remain. Programs can still struggle to find good placements and cooperating teachers for all of their candidates. The horizontal staffing pattern used in college and university-based programs has clear weaknesses, and novices still find that too much of their coursework is theoretical rather than practical. But that generally isn't the critique that we hear. Instead, we hear that teacher education programs, as we know them, are broken. Or maybe they never worked at all. So let's wrap up. Imagine we have a time machine and we transport a teacher from 1816 into this room. Imagine then that we select a present day classroom teacher at random and we put both of them into a typical school. Is there any doubt about which teacher would have received better training? In terms of what new teachers know about young people, the process of learning, the development of lessons, the practice of teaching a particular discipline, ways of engaging different kinds of students, strategies for professional growth, and many other core elements of successful teaching, problems in the field of teacher preparation have been solved. But the same is not true of core dilemmas. In fact, some of the policy approaches that characterized teacher training 200 years ago are currently being floated as novel ways of addressing the field. As a result, we not only run the risk of repeating the past, but also the possibly greater risk of disparaging a field in which great strides have in fact been made. Thus, despite great progress, it remains, quote, an accepted truth, according to Kate Walsh, that the field is broken. So what conclusions can we draw? The first is pretty simple. The system isn't broken. Imperfect? Absolutely. Do problems still need to be solved? Absolutely. But broken, broken implies a kind of decline that there just isn't evidence to support, nor is there evidence to support the argument that teacher training doesn't work. The second key lesson when we take the long view is that problems have been solved, and though problems remain, we can solve those too, and they're worth focusing on, even if sometimes it feels like tinkering. The third lesson here is that pre-service training will always be imperfect because no effort to manage dilemmas is inherently better than another. Each involves trade-offs. So rather than framing different strategies for managing dilemmas as solutions, we might more effectively discuss the different trade-offs that are being made and whether those trade-offs square with what we value. Finally, I think it's important to note that given these three lessons, there will very rarely be any total game changers. It can be really tempting to look at present conditions when they're imperfect and say, I have a simple way to fix that. But the question that comes to my mind is, why didn't anybody else think of that over the past 200 years? When we take the long view, it's easier to see that, surprise, somebody has tried it. And then we have to ask, why did things change? Why didn't my silver bullet succeed? And the answer is usually that there were trade-offs involved and that over time, people grew tired of those trade-offs and they wanted to try something new because they didn't imagine that those trade-offs of their new arrangement would be equally problematic. So if we remember that fact, we can continue moving forward slowly, but forward. If we forget, however, we condemn ourselves to march in circles and we doom ourselves to policy churn. Thank you. <laughs>